So I want to welcome everybody this morning. Um, I, I really appreciate you taking time out of what I know are very stacked and busy schedules. Um, I'm Mike Carmen. I'm with Kentuckiana Works, and we are hosting this uh, webinar really as a part of a couple of grants that we have um, that are funded by the National Fund for Workforce Solutions. Um, one of the grants is entitled Redesign Jobs Resilient Worker. Uh, the other is Generation Works. And in both cases, we're really looking at um, top of the list, racial equity. Um, we're looking at worker voice, uh, youth worker voice, and job quality indicators. And from an employer standpoint, how uh, recruitment and retention of employees can improve uh, as we improve in the areas that I just mentioned. Um, I'm very happy to have Gifted by Design, a local organization uh, leading us today, and I am also very happy to turn it over to them now to kind of introduce themselves. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, Mike, and um, thank you for uh, just being um, just gracious in this process. Um, we are here um, today. My name is Letty Johnson. I am the CEO of Gifted by Design Leadership and Consulting. And I have on the line with me today, I have uh, Stevon Edwards, um, and I will momentarily give her opportunity to say hello um, as we jump into um, what we are uh, going to be dialoguing about today. Um, so this session is a very interactive session today. Um, we classify this as a group coaching process. Um, so there will be many questions um, that we will be asking throughout our time. Um, this session will last 90 minutes um, and we will be um, really uh, looking to you because you are the experts in terms of uh, your particular organizations and businesses. Um, however, though, we will uh, facilitate and guide you and create um, a new level of awareness when we talk about the various frameworks, um, when we talk about workforce, as well as um, workplace equity, okay, workplace equity. Um, and so I want to uh, pause for this moment, allow Sivan, um, our other uh, facilitator for today, to speak to you, and then I will take it back and I will give us uh, the lay of the land in terms of our agenda, our key learning objectives, um, and then we will go further into um, what we know for our time together today. Yvonne, you wanna take it? Greetings all, I'm very excited to have this conversation about transformation and working toward racial equity. We hope that you leave today with some um, tangible next steps in order to improve equity within the workplace and a better understanding of what it means. Often we use the word equity and it seems pretty nebulous. Uh, so we're going to deep dive deep into that definition and actually how to implement it um, so that your culture can improve and also retention as well as results. Excellent. Thank you, Stevan. Thank you for being here with me. So just before we jump into, I want to do a few housekeeping things. Um, Sivan has already noted in the um, chat that this session is being recorded. Um, so uh, we want to remind you to be mindful of that. Um, also um, want to remind you that there is an opportunity for you to change um, your name um, or rename yourself um, so that when we're having conversation, we know who we are speaking with. Um, and then I would also, when, when you are commenting, especially when you make your first comment, I would invite you to kind of share your role in your particular organization so we'll know who is in the room. I know there are a few HR people who are here with us today, and so certainly want to um, engage you at your particular position. Uh, and then lastly, again, I will just remind you, this will be an interactive session, so make sure you have paper and pencil um, to actually be able to do some writing and some reflection work as we navigate through our conversation today. Um, so, Stephon, will you go to the agenda, please? Um, so, Mike has already done a gracious job of introduction as well as myself. 
Um, our key learning objectives I will review here momentarily. We will get into understanding really briefly uh, an introduction to being an equitable workplace. Um, I will highlight um, a couple of frameworks and um, Steve on will talk to us about some of the data points. Um, as we know, you know, we often because we are um, doing the work every day, we may not necessarily contextualize what it really looks like, what it really means um, holistically from a workforce um, standpoint in terms of the numbers. So we really wanted to be able to provide you um, some depthness around uh, that data. Um, and then we're going to do some identity work. We're going to jump into what does it mean to use your particular influence um, in the intersections of workplace equity. Um, and then we're going to uh, move you into the conceptualization of what we like to um, utilize as an equitable framework, and that is through our transformation change design. Um, and it has five objectives. The first objective is the clarity question. The second objective is the systems question. The third objective is the opportunity question. The fourth objective is the culture question. And the fifth objective is the improvement question. And then we will open the floor for a Q&A. We are very much so open for you all to um, ask us questions. We want this to be interactive learning. So we invite you, you know, to put it in the chat. If you um, uh, think of something through the time, um, feel free to put it in there and eventually we will address the questions or we will open the floor um, where we feel like uh, questions are appropriate. So will you move us into our key learning objectives? <clears throat> so during our time together, um, interactively, uh, we're going to learn about um, the critical examination of organizational priorities, practices, values, and investments. We're also going to explore goals for organizational help. Um, and we're going to hear from one another to help synthesize that. Um, and we're going to teach you what our framework is. And then um, we're going to do some uh, some centering of voices and how we can help to amplify those who have um, what we consider to be the more vulnerable populations. OK, um, so I want to stop for a moment and just pause and say we are extremely excited that you decided to join us this morning. You elected to be here. We know that oftentimes it can be challenging um, early in the morning, right, to uh, critically think. Uh, but we, we invite you to learn, be willing to unlearn, and be willing to relearn. So this process, willing to lean in, but also understand that we know that it is uncomfortable when we talk about race racism and the impacts of it that it had has it has had historically and structurally on our workplaces as well as our community so we we appreciate you all being here um, our number one priority as facilitators um, for this conversation today is psychological safetyness we want to make sure that people feel safe they feel invited into the conversation that they have a sense of belonging. So transformation starts with us. So as we know that in the um, manufacturing and construction world, there are no shortcuts. We feel the same way about workplace equity. There are no shortcuts. And in order to increase your retention, increase your recruitment, we know that safety is first and foremost. And so we just invite you to participate in this conversation in a very transparent way. So jumping into today's presentation, people don't learn when they understand. They learn when they feel understood. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna invite you to unmute or type in the chat box and just tell us a little bit about what you are facing in your particular um, employer, at your particular employer. What are you facing when we talk about work, work, the workforce?
I know we have some talkers in this group. I've I've, I've met a lot of you. <laughs> Here we go, going into the chat. Okay. Eric said difficulty attracting and retaining employees. Amy said retention. Anyone else? I'm gonna I'm gonna speak also because this one would be a little bit too long for me to chat. Okay. Um, Good. Thank you. We, we we have issues with um uh, like the future outlook of the job selling selling an employee to come in at a, a entry level position with the not necessarily the promise but with the outlook of working their way through and you know becoming a team lead or becoming a manager uh, just some difficulty with that also maybe that's all part of the retention that i that i mentioned before mm -hmm. so skilling up skilling up skilling mm -hmm. up yes yeah absolutely thank you eric any anyone else want to give any examples of what you're currently facing within the context of your particular industry employer you know i'm working in healthcare right now i work for masonic homes a senior living living uh, community we're still facing uh, a lot of burnout and it's becoming a little more critical especially with the management at management level at uh -huh. the care level so that is absolutely impacting our efficiency in some cases and then also, you know, what I'm finding is that still, we're still struggling to get people to come back to work, come back mm. to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have in the chat and shared when hiring Hi, or trying to hire when potential applicants are transparent about their burnout as a reason for applying. And there's a lot of negative judgment rather than compassion around this burnout. Mm. Yeah, uh, just a, a recent, a very recent event where an applicant shared uh, very transparently and authentically um, that they, the one reason they were leaving where they were and applying was, was because of burnout and then just not very much acceptance or understanding about that to look at the rest of the applicant, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Ann. I want to hear just one or two more. We have 14 people on. We talked about burnout. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I'm a CEO of Selvoval Riverboat, so a little bit of a unique organization, but certainly we have all the challenges that have already been listed. Um, being still relatively new in this very old organization, one of the things that I personally see as a challenge is shifting our culture um, to one that is more um, Aggressive or accepting, um, not only of their coworkers, but also of all the diverse audiences that we aim to bring into our attraction. Um, and it's not a matter so much of people intentionally being discriminatory. Um, I guess that's maybe often the case in the world, but just not knowing what they don't know and trying to create a more accepting culture again for both the employees so that they have a better experience and the passengers as well because i feel very strongly you know your guest experience is never going to be better than your employees experience <laughs> so um it, we've got kind of an old versus new situation where we've got some old timers who've been here a very long time and who we value tremendously because of their knowledge and the traditions that they need to hand off um, to the next generation. But the next generation has a lot of different mentalities in many ways. And I think we're just trying to adapt to that. 
Thank you, Krista. Does anyone else have a comment? Because I want to pick up right where um, she left off, but I do want to just open it up just in case someone else wanted to chime in. All right. So it's very interesting. So we're going to get into that today, Krista. We're going to talk a little bit about the intersectionalities, right, of how do we shift this culture, right, into a more accepting, but yet understanding that we all come from a different lens of influence. Um, and it, it, it all can be elevated, right? And it all can be invited um, into the space because that's what as inclusion, okay? That's what we know as inclusion. So thank you so much for sharing that information and all of those who participated. So let's go ahead and go jump into the social uh, determinants activity. Um, with this particular activity, I would like to really, um, I want you to take a look at this chart. Social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, they grow, live, and work. And so as you take a look at this chart, I want you to write down what are some of the social determinants employees are faced with? What are some things that you have heard inside of your particular business that people have been impacted by? That people have been impacted by? I want you to write that down. And once you have indicated um, what those determinants are, I want you to find those determinants on the chart. And I want you to just kind of look at the outcomes as a result of the social determinants of health that have been impacted, that is associated with it. So for example, if it is health and well-being, there is a component of psychological stress, stress that is associated with that. And as a result of that, it could lead into mental health and addictions. So I want you to begin to frame some of the things that have been um, determinants in your particular workplace. Give you about a minute to do so. Now I want to open the floor. I want to open the floor to ask, what are some of the social determinants that your employees are currently dealing with? Feel, feel free to unmute or even um, type in the chat. I have the chat box open. I'll just jump in and say um, the first couple that popped out at me are health and well-being mm -hmm. and low income, or I guess it's called income and social status. Mm -hmm. I, I, we, we don't have um, a group of people who are used to taking care of themselves on the health and well-being side of things. So, you know, that shows up in the workplace in a lot of different ways. Um, whether it's more likely to have workplace injuries or outside of workplace injuries that affect their time at work, um, and certainly the psychological stress as well. Um, and also, uh, you know, we have a lot of seasonal workers um, and a kind of a broad selection of jobs you may not expect, but uh, certainly one, a lot of them I would say come from a you know lower income background. 
Okay. Thank you. So in the chat, we have Steve who said, um, child care, transportation, high, high bills, low wages. Eric, uh, social support networks. Um, Tracy said, uh, Steve's list plus housing instability. And I want to make sure I'm saying your name. Is it Bryson? Please correct me if I'm. You got it. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Social and spiritual environments. Anyone else? I did want to comment um, on what Krista said. Uh, Krista brought out that these social determinants, especially when it comes to mental health, can impact job performance. Mm -hmm. So in thinking about job performance and team dynamics, also, what sh social determinants are impacting those results within the workplace? Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Yes, I also think we have to consider the last couple of years with um, COVID, lack of you know connectivity within the office. That's why I when the, the one I said was the uh, social support. Um, you know, not knowing where to go for support, just not having to be able to stand up and talk to the guy next to you or the girl next to you who's been working there for 30 years, who knows everything. So I think that sort of thing, and that might be a little bit more recent, but definitely a high priority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would totally underscore that. Um, and on the, the psychological stress piece, we are very fortunate that we're part of Louisville Metro. So we have access to great insurance and all kinds of resources on the health um, and well-being side of things, but you have to be willing to take part in those resources. And from a cultural standpoint, we have a number of folks who are just not accustomed to taking um, advantage of therapy or um, EAP programs, um, or even you know being proactive about their physical health. So that's the really interesting thing is we have all the resources almost that you could imagine and people still don't necessarily take part in them. Great point, which um, leads us into, and so I wanna um, just offer another opportunity one last time in case someone else wanted to lean in on this part of the conversation, but I think it's important um, from a historical and structural um, perspective, and Stephen's going to give us some um, racial equity index uh, data, and then we're going to move into, because that, that plays a key role, right? That plays a key role. Okay, so I'm going to try my best to zoom in on these, because I want your, um, I want you to observe and then share with me your observations on these charts here. So in looking at the race and ethnic composition of Louisville, Kentucky, and Indiana, because we are Kentuckiana. From 1980 to 2050, this is predicted. Um, what do you notice? What do you notice? And is this reflected in your workplace or within your industry as well? Well, I think the obvious thing to notice is the reduction in white and the increase in minorities over the next several years and over the past 30. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to further your question, is it reflective of our workforce? I believe, <clears throat> excuse me, I believe it is at my company. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Any, anyone else? Is that also, is that trend also reflected within your industry and the workforce as well? Or is it not? And do you know the reasons why? I, I honestly, I'll just say, sorry. No, go okay, ahead. Amy and then Krista. <laughs> um, honestly, I, I consider us to be, um, I'm with Paradise Tomato Kitchens. I'm the HR manager here. Um, we have a hugely diverse group of individuals. Um, our white population is 48%. Mm -hmm. um, so the rest of our workforce is from a minority group. Um, and we've got two locations here in Lowell. That is the both locations in together um, when you look at that. 
And I think some of our things that we kind of really have been looking at is, is where we are and the folks that we are bringing into our business and how we can grow them within our company into other um, positions, you know, whether it's through tuition reimbursement, um, we actually just hired on a workforce development manager to identify skills gaps and move people into um, higher paying positions versus our entry level positions. So I'm pretty excited. Um, that's probably why Mike <laughs> is always so very excited to talk with me is we're, we're really wanting to do some things to help um, bridge that gap for our workforce. So Amy, it says Paradise Tomato Kitchens, but I want everyone to be clear what industry you are referring to. Um, we are a food manufacturer. Okay. Uh, Krista, you were going to say something. Yeah, I, I was going to say I'm glad to hear what Amy said because I'm here to hopefully learn how we can step more in that direction. Our workforce, um, which is about 25 year-round people, and then we typically triple that during our cruising season. Um, regardless, our workforce does not reflect this trend um, and also tends to be skewed um, more male than female. So I'm here to help learn how we can be more reflective of the you know racial and ethnic composition that you're showing on the screen. So something else to also uh, bring up is if you see that your workplace does not necessarily reflect this trend and maybe it is skewed the other way to where people of color have more representation within your workplace, also consider the positions that people of color have. Is this trend more reflected in your leadership and your C-suite positions? Or is the trend the opposite when it comes to your lower level and low visibility positions as well? So those are also some pieces to think about when we think about improving equity within the workplace. Not only does our overall workplace have a really great racial and ethnic distribution in order to represent different voices, but how are they represented within the workplace based on position? So taking a look at this chart here, this is reflecting um, the working, what is qualified as the working poor. So this is the percentage of each group of people that identify as a poverty level of 200%, 200% or more that actually have full-time jobs, but still qualify in the poverty line. So you'll see um, of all the people who qualify within that poverty range, 9% are employed in full-time jobs. Then it also stratifies them by race and ethnicity. And you see that the highest percentage of people who qualify as uh, being in poverty that are employed is Latino, the Latino population or Latinx population at 18% of individuals who qualify uh, within that poverty range. And so the question here is, can full-time jobs lift everyone out of poverty? Trista said no. Nope. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> well, if the, if the answer is no, let's go into the why. Why is that? And Eric, you said something a little bit that answers this question earlier on in the webinar, if people were listening, but why is that? Well, if you're going to refer to what I said earlier, then I guess that it's because employees are expecting an immediate or potential employees are expecting an immediate fix to their problems the second they start working and don't realize that you know, maybe you have to put in, you know, instead of starting a job, staying there for two months and being like, this isn't working for me, I'm going to go to a new job and start again at the bottom, or a year later, instead of putting in the time and gradually working your way up and working to a higher salary role. I don't know. Okay, so let's go beyond individual level and let's think systemically. Why possibly are full-time jobs not enough to lift people 
out of poverty. Evelyn said it's also that some of them are starting from behind the start line, past debt and family. Uh, yeah, past debt and family. Right, we're getting into the social determinants, yes. Yes, Evelyn. <laughs> we're getting into the social determinants, anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I would just say we're not, as, again, systemically, we're not paying people enough. Wages, big, yes. You've got a big differential in, you know, the high end and the, and the front line workers. Yeah, I was I was thinking that that was the answer that y'all were thinking was wages. But I was like, let me just wait and see. But that was what I was thinking. I was like, most times, you know, most jobs don't start you off at like twenty dollars an hour, you know. So, and those are yes. jobs. The difference is wages, Eric. You mentioned that earlier um, when you first made a comment was that folks are not, you know, we're we're going through. Um, not a hiring freeze, but rather an employment freeze. Like people aren't accepting jobs right now because they are waiting for those wages to increase so that they can be economically mobile. And we understand that as employers, that can sometimes be difficult to start everybody at $25 an hour. But we also have to understand that living wage means the cost of living is covered. And that's not often what is, what is offered within jobs that require um, less degree level, less skill level, which, but it's still needed for someone in order to live each and every day. So we get into the question of, can all workers earn a living wage? So these, this is a breakdown of the median hourly wage by race and ethnicity prior to COVID, right? This is 2019. So this is not today's data three, almost four years later, which we cannot even imagine at this point, but um, this is pre-COVID. So you see that um, in this graph, $20 was the average for all, but then you have a breakdown of the median wage by race. And you see that the lowest median wage, the lowest median uh, wage was actually among the Latin Latinx population at $15, okay? Now we think, well, this is not $7.50, but let's go back to the graph we had before where the majority of people who qualified as uh, within that range of poverty who were working full-time jobs was Latino. So now we have the majority of people who are uh, the greatest number, excuse me, of people within a population that have full-time jobs but still qualify as poverty are making the minimum, minimum wage out of all of the groups that we have stratified here in this graph. So there's correlation to the wage piece, okay? Are people being paid enough for the work that they do? Do we as employers value every single position and every single person in the work that they do. So we got a couple of comments in the chat. Evelyn, she said minimum wage hasn't gone up since like 2010, 725 mm -hmm. is not enough to pay bills. Mm -hmm. uh, Krista had actually had a question. She said, is this all US workers or just in certain types of positions? So this would be all workers specific to Louisville, Kentucky and Indiana. So this is Kentuckyana numbers. Okay, specifically Kentucky and numbers. And this is 2019 data. What is the poverty? What is considered poverty making under what a year or? Um, I know it's 200%, but I don't remember what the annual is for a family of four. I think it's what, 20? Is that, is that what it is? is it 20, 20, 25? It's between that range for a family of four. I can send out some, um, our data person, Sarah, who, who many of you know, does some excellent uh, charting around this. And I can, uh, following the meeting, I'll send out some um, recent uh, slides she's put together around this. It, it's pretty alarming, really, because when you start factoring in, um, you know, children and, uh, God forbid, mm -hmm. a medical condition, it, it's, um, uh, it can be pretty alarming to look at those numbers. So I've Thanks. also linked the data source in the chat for you all to explore because you can explore by region, you can explore um, 
You can explore economic vitality, as well as connectedness, economic benefit, demographics. It's a really great interactive tool. So now we have, um, let me move to the next slide. I almost forgot I had a next slide, buddy. So <laughs> we have job and wage growth, Louisville, Kentucky, and Indiana. So this is the uh, growth in jobs and earnings by wage level from 1990 to 2020. And what are your observations here? I don't know if this is the answer, but I'll say it. Are we, we're losing the, the middle class. Mm. How, Krista, how are we losing it's, the middle class? Well, if the green, the grass green color was 72% in 1990 on the left. Maybe I'm looking at this chart wrong. Um, so on so the, the right, one on the left is jobs, and the right. one on the right is earnings per worker. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that is the amount of growth that has happened since 1990, all the way to 2020. Oh. So this graph states okay. that low wage jobs, the number of low wage jobs, has increased by 22 percent. The number of middle wage jobs has increased by 72 percent, and the number of high wage jobs has only increased by 14 percent. However, when you look at the wages for each job, they've only increased around the same rate for each of those different positions. Mm -hmm. So what are, oh, there's something going on in the chat here. Middle oh. class is shrinking. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, uh, Stephen brought up a good point. Minimum wage has no bearing when market demands has effectively moved the starting wage much higher. The question is the nature of the jobs being filled by various races. Why are Latinos and Black people filling the lower paying jobs, pulling down the average, and how can, how can, what, how can what be established, Stephen, to, how can we establish a more level playing field for all? Okay, there we go. How can we establish a more level playing field for all? That's a really great comment, especially in uh, for this slide itself, because we often see jobs posted that require a doctorate degree for $58,000. <laughs> so high wage level jobs may be increasing, but wages are not increasing. So then you have individuals who pass on those jobs. So as employers, we need to think about these things. What is equitable? We already have pay and wage gaps when it comes to gender. We have pay and wage gaps when it comes to race. But there's even pay and wage gaps when it comes to position and skill and qualification that we must think about in order to improve equity within the workplace, within the industry, within our economy, period. Are there any other observations before we move on? Um, Evelyn had put in the chat, she said in 2018, the federal poverty income threshold was 25,465 for a family of four with two children, and then $17,308 for a single parent of one child. If a family's total income is less than the corresponding threshold, then that family and every individual in it is considered in poverty. That's right. Thank you, Evelyn. If there are no additional comments, Letty, I'll turn it back to you for now. Okay. 
And so I kind of wanted to just kind of um, talk a little bit about the equitable, the inequitable compound, right? We know low wages, which we just had a robust conversation around that, um, the unpredictable schedules, the unsupportive workplace cultures, uh, limited opportunities um, of a, advancement. And so the inequitable compound relates to the philosophy of the social determinants that we have already identified and we've kind of um, elevated earlier in the conversation. And then it's compounded with um, an inequitable workplace, right? So low compassion or no compassion, um, no flexibility or limited flexibility, um, no advancement or limited advancement. And so we have to think about really what that um, that means, right? When we talk about um, being an inclusive and um, an, an equitable organization. And so we'll dive a little bit further into that, but I really wanted um, us to watch a, a brief video of an organization that um, is called Homework Health. It's, um, it's actually in Canada and they're a mental health and addiction services organization. Um, with the uh, evolving workforce, they decided to be very intentional about centering racial equity um, in their organization on all levels. Um, and so they put a clear path forward um, and they began a journey um, in regards to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, they have created a, a partnership with um, the Canadian Center for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, which is known as CDCDI. And that is a forward-looking social organization that provides research and learning supports to organizations that are working to create environments of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The partnership enables each of their employees to access um, CDCDI's extensive knowledge uh, repository and gives their organization access to knowledge, training, ideas, strategy, expertise that they can fulfill their full journey on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so I'm going to have um, Stevan play this video. Play close attention to um, the framework of this video. Um, write down one takeaway from the video and then we're going to discuss it once the video is complete. Workplace equity is the fair treatment for employees in every facet of life, regardless of their gender expression, race, disability, religion, nationality, sexual orientation, or age. Equity promotes an individual's right to be different. Equity in the workplace makes sure people are given equal opportunities, equal pay, and are accepted and respected for their differences. The two primary aims of equity are diversity and inclusion. Diversity values the differences between people, including those of different races, ethnicities, genders, ages, religions, disabilities, and sexual orientations. Inclusion is when every person in society is valued, heard, supported, and respected, and people feel a sense of belongingness. Equal opportunity is a state of fairness in which individuals are unhampered by artificial barriers, gatekeeping, or prejudices or preferences. A fair company will provide equal employment opportunities to all employees. It prohibits discrimination and harassment. How to achieve workplace equality. Offer diversity and inclusion training. Implement training programs focusing on the two things that make equity, diversity and inclusion. Identify and prevent unconscious biases. Unconscious biases are the snap judgments based on social stereotypes. Unconscious biases are made and processed by our brains within a fraction of a second, and we're not usually aware they're happening. We all hold unconscious beliefs about various social and identity groups. These stem from our inherent cognitive tendency to organize and categorize our social worlds. When they influence our hiring habits and workplace behaviors to affect others negatively, unconscious bias has very unfair consequences. Be aware of indirect discrimination. Discrimination takes place in a variety of ways. Discrimination is often subtle, and discriminatory remarks are not often made directly. Recruit an HR department well-versed in diversity and equality to implement these values into the recruitment process. Attracting and increasing diverse talent is a significant competitive differentiator for recruiters and talent acquisition leaders to develop. Offer workplace policies that appeal to diverse candidates. 
Personality assessments do an excellent job of measuring candidates' personality traits, motivations, and skills. So as you watch that video, what is something that you took away from that video? What did you notice? So Krista said visually represented diversity. Yep. Um, Evelyn said that I like the encouragement to do personality tests to get a better gauge of talent. <laughs> Krista said I like the personality test suggestion too. Yeah, we're going to talk about those tools, those tools that, that you can. I think it was. Bryson. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, um, that's okay. I think for me, I think it was a really put together video. I really enjoyed just everything that it put in there. I think that it talked about a lot of information in just a two minute video. You mm -hmm. know, and I honestly made me think that I think that every organization company needs to have something like this, like maybe an onboarding video like this to be able to really tell people about inclusion and, you know, things like that. Yes, Bryson, exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's what we wanted to do. We're trying to raise your level of awareness and thinking of ideas as such. Great yeah. job. Yeah, I think that video was really, really good. Um, Krista said the emphasis that unconscious bias is unconscious. <laughs> Krista, you want to talk about that, speak to that a little bit? Well, we, we talk about, I, I guess that one jumped out at me because I, I learned that about the culture <clears throat> here that I talked about that we're trying to shift. Um, it's not coming from an intentionally negative, bad place, but people don't know what they don't know. So if you're just used to hiring people who look like you, then you're going to keep hiring people who look like you. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to be aware of your own personal biases and, of course, what exists in the organization in order to overcome that. But if you're not even willing to face it, then you just keep doing the same thing over and over again, again, unconsciously, because... Mm -hmm. It takes proactivity to break that cycle. Oh, that is spot on. Spot on. Anyone else? I, I actually would like to piggyback on Krista because we have done an unbi um, unconscious bias training to particularly figure out what biases we have when it comes from recruiting, whether it's whatever it is. Um, and so, you know, honestly, I don't think a lot of people realize that. And then when you go into do a recruiting and a collaboration session and it says, you know, how, do, how do they fit in the organization? You know, what's their organizational fit? Well, you know, it's okay to have a diverse group of individuals. They don't quite have to fit in the organization. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, I'm trying to help people understand is why are we looking at organizational fit? Can they yes. do the job and are they capable of doing the job? Thank you, Amy. I just did a racial equity training through Workforce 180, I think. Um, and they talked about groundwater and this unconscious bias. And it's for a lot of people, it's just, I don't want to say lazy thinking, but that's the term that's kind of popping up. It's because it's our <laughs> comfort zone and it's, what we're used to, like we don't have to actively engage in the potential and it's we when doing that we're limiting our creativity and we're limiting our workforce and kind of continuing to. 
I don't want to say create barriers, but that's what we're doing. So with that unconscious bias, it's, does it fit? And I think that's what, you know, people were just talking about. It's, we don't have to fit. Not everything is going to fit into this structure, this box. It's just being able to say, hey, what are they going to bring to the table? Because they might bring some really great stuff. And it's being able to be aware that our bias might be preventing us from doing that because we're looking at experience or we're looking at skin color. Or we're looking at, you know, where they've been in the past. And I think sometimes it's about changing the box, right, Evelyn, <laughs> to your point, as opposed to yes. finding the individual or shaping the individual. How do we change the box? Mm -hmm. The systemic, yes. the systemic. Yes. yes. Um, Anne posted in the chat box, great quote, it takes pro proactivity to break that cycle. And then she said, thank you, Krista. <laughs> Was there someone else trying to make a comment? No? Okay, let's keep going. So one of the highlights, um, and you all have kind of spoken to this, is workplace equity is rooted in diversity and inclusion. And I think that it, it's extremely important for us as employers to really, um, to, as, as we stated, you know, really think about this box and how do we look at the systemic right how do we invite um in the onboarding process a video as such how do we um how do we look at the social determinants and align strategy through that and that's one of the reasons why i had steve on to join us today because that's some of the work that we do on a daily basis in terms of equity audits helping you to come up with action plans to really help you to navigate um, a framework in which uh, and identify your blind spots, right, as employers. And so I want to go into um, just talking briefly about some examples of some of the frameworks. Um, as uh, Mike uh, uh, shared earlier, he talked about uh, the National Fund for Workforce Solutions. Um, they have a framework uh, that is, is uh, rooted in racial equity. Um, and so they have four pillars that they um, kind of uh, mobilize, which is the core uh, support, the opportunity, and the voice. So, um, and we will uh, ensure that you get access to this link as well, so that you can kind of look through this in a more in-depth way, because I want to um, move into our next uh, section. But also, Stephon, will you bring up um, the Good Jobs Framework, because I want to also lean um into that just a little bit um the good jobs framework um and, and like i said there are many workforce frameworks these two i just elevated because i know that kentuckiana works has relationship with um the national uh workforce and then this one particular good jobs framework is one that i have seen several organizations really lean in on um because they're uh Framework is looking at it from a comprehensive uh, job quality and what is important to the workers today. Um, and so uh, they really look at the drivers, the compensation, um, agency and culture. They're looking at the structure, the structure of things, um, how the organization is set up, what policies and practices um, that uh, are currently being um, advocated for, being sponsored, um, and being um, in, uh, ingrained into the culture. And then lastly, they look at advancement. And so again, we'll make sure that you guys um, have this information. There will be pieces of today's presentation that we will share with you. Um, uh, there is some pieces that we're, we're not able to share because of the, 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 the rights of it, but there will be, you will receive these frameworks because we really want to help you as a place of awareness, collective awareness today as a group to really be thinking about what is it somewhat, what are some ways that we can um, really engage into a new workforce mindset, right? Um, will you go to the next slide, please? One of uh, the strategies that we like to influence is um, values-based leadership, okay? Values-based leadership. So centering the values. And um, um, Homewood Health 
what they have done is they have really taken an in-depth look at their values. Um, and, and I'm going to bring that up in just a second, but I want to stop and just kind of give you some, a framework of what values-based leadership, what that looks like. Not only are you centering it, um, but you're also elevating the behaviors that are associated with interpersonally. Um, you're elevating and looking at fairness, right? Treating everybody equitably, equitably, um, also being not not being condescending towards um, employees when a mistake is made. So really uh, uh, leaning into that uh, compassion framework. Um, also uh, personal actions and expectations, holding self to high eth ethical standards, right? So that interpersonal self leadership, and we're gonna actually do some work around that in here in just a moment. And then looking at organizational leadership, how are we communicating? How are we articulating our vision? Are our folks, are they um, being able to internalize and digest uh, what our vision is for our organization, what the values are of the organization, and have they been able to, um, to play a role in that, in the messaging of that? How are they owning that? Um, and we, we say values-based leadership because everybody deserves to be led well. And we know that what is authentic to us is helping people to uh, really lead and live their values. That's how we really um, transform our, um, our workforce. So will you go to the next slide, Sivan? So as we, um, you know, are thinking through our strategies and really, um, understanding what is it that we feel that employees they're looking for so we've kind of gotten the um the list started right we've already identified just in conversation we we talked about the flexibility and the autonomy we talked about also economics wages right particularly are there other things that you feel like as an employee right of a business that you want from your work experience or what is it that you feel like your employees are looking for as well? Any ideas, any thoughts? You know, something I saw recently and, and I found it a little bit surprising. I'm not sure why it surprised me, but the opportunity to participate in philanthropy, you know, such as those days of giving or, or days when, when you come together as a team to volunteer and do some activity uh, that benefits some charity, but that can be very impactful and important for an employee. Um, and and I, I think it's, it's good team building too, is kind of a side mm -hmm. benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. What are some things that you've heard? What are the things, what, what do you want your work experience? So this is where it starts. We, this is where self-awareness, emotional intelligence is so important because we're, it, we can't influence that which we don't know. And so as we talk about, you know, creating this experience and living out these frameworks, right? And increasing our retention and our recruitment, we first have to do the work, right? We've got to think through, we got to get curious. And that's the reason why we're asking you these questions. Evelyn said, people want to know they, they are cared about. Absolutely, absolutely. I think predictability, uh, especially around scheduling, um, it, it, can be really important, especially folks with children, not as, not exclusively people with children, but um, mm -hmm. predictable scheduling uh, can be really important. Yeah, absolutely. So I think for me, and I know Mike knows this, I work for NAMI Louisville, and what we do is a stigma-free um, workplace initiative program. So mm -hmm. I, I think we need more in the way of making sure that employees have those type of stigma around mental health days or days where they feel as if they just need to take a day off, you know, more doing equality when it comes to stigma around mental health. You know, I think that's a big one for me is just making sure that all companies allow people to have days where they're not feeling themselves, you know, or allow days where they're not being able to, you know, do things that they want to do. So I think mm -hmm. that's what I think we should, you know, I think I want that for all employees, you know, in companies. Mm hmm. Um, Michelle said, agree. They want to know they are value. You are absolutely correct, Michelle. 
um, Sivan, will you uh, hit the thing? Employees want to know that they, this is the number one value. 100%, there was a recent study that was done that um, by Jack Wiley and employees want to know that they are given respect, that they are respected and valued, right? And so when we break that down, Jack broke it down and I wanted to share with you all because I think it's important that we recognize that recognition, a pat on the back, right? Um, an exciting workplace, right? So not doing the same thing every day, but being able to provide some some challenges and creating some interest, right? And 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 also employees want to have fun, right? They they want to have fun. Um, they also want job security, right? They want to know that um, that they are going to be able to come into work and earn their pay, earn their um, their uh, their salary and. Um, and, and, and they want education opportunities. They want to develop their skills. Um, they want the conditions um, for physical and socially, and they want it to be comfortable and well-equipped. And lastly, they want their leaders to be transparent and to be honest. So when we looked at the, the numbers, here are some statistics, statistics for you. So 20% of um, the employees wanted recognition recognition um six percent wanted exciting work right security was high at 19 percent but 25 percent wanted a livable wage pay is extremely important um there was eight percent education and career opportunity 15 percent in terms of conditions and then eight percent in terms of truth you're absolutely right, Michelle. Recognition goes a long way. Employees want to be appreciated and they want to be respected. Um, and so, Stephen, will you go to um, home? Yeah, thank you. So the core values. So I talked about this a little bit before. So when um, Homewood Health was going through um, their equity journey, they wanted to understand really what was important to the employees so that they could incorporate it into their value system, okay? So these are the values that they came up with. They came up with uh, service excellence, innovation, collaboration, and integrity. These were the four that rose to the top for them. And when we talk about helping employees to lean in and really um, live out and, and want to come to work, we have to understand that the values have to be those that they believe in, right? That they are willing to um, advocate for and that they're willing to sponsor. And so as we are um, continuing, we don't have a lot of time left, but as we are continuing in um, today's session, we're going to do a little bit of identity work as well as values work. But before we get into it, I want Sivan to um, take us through an activity around language so that we have a clear definition of what we are referring to when we talk about work workplace equity. I hit the wrong button. So as we um, look at equality and equity, just based on these visual, these visuals here on the screen, um, and I will describe them. So in the first, in the equality box, you see three individuals, all of the same height. They are standing in front of a fence, but they are standing at, on different levels of ground. And so one person can't see anything, one person can, has a partial view of what's on the other side of the fence, and another person can completely see what is happening. In the equity visual, you have all three individuals, the same individuals of the same height, but the individual that couldn't see anything over the fence is now standing on two boxes so that they can see over the fence and you have the individual in the middle who had a partial view, they're now standing on one box so they can see over the fence as well. And so what are your observations on these two images here?
Well, it, it definitely underscores the myth of the even playing field that we're all um, starting from the same place, which, um, you know, you, you do hear that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I also think with equity, it is going just going back to that basic concept of what matters most. And, you know, um, I'm sure all of your employees are just, our employees are always the same. Transportation, reliable communication. You know, they've got families that, who can afford a mobile plan for five, five people in your family right now? That's mm -hmm. reliable. You don't have to continue to, you know, <laughs> renew and recharge with dollars and whatnot. So, you know, for me, think, sitting here thinking as an employee, as an employer, um, the equity the equity graphic there really means providing what matters most, but it's different for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So That's what it, we found, you know, at the Sonic is let's tackle the barriers that are we know are most common. That's transportation. Um, going back to the mobile phone service, how many of you have a hard time finding your employees because they continue to buy burner phones? Mm. That so just some things that I've been thinking of and that we're doing to at least get started on the equity part of this. We're providing um, TARC passes free for our employees. We're also providing a very affordable uh, Verizon mobile plan with a new phone, $18 a paycheck, and that's per line. So what you might pay $200 for, you can get for, let's say $70 a paycheck, you know, something like that if you have family members. And again, you know, we're all we're all taking different approaches with this, but that's really what we're doing at Masonic. And what I as an employee appreciate too is that it's not about, you know, it's fairness, of course, but it really is that equity piece because what matters most to me could be different than what matters most to somebody else. And let's take, you know, the race out of it. I mean, there are our employees that have just these social barriers, social uh, socioeconomic barriers that we just have to pay attention to. And it's hard work. And I, I've gotten a lot of it out of the presentation today. And I want to thank you all, um, Letty and Stevan, for bringing this forward. I, I have some really good takeaways. But I think, again, to me, it is what matters most and having a sincere desire to fulfill that the best that we can. And that's wonderful, you, Tracy. Tracy, that um, your organization is thinking systemically. What policies and practices can we change internally to shift and meet the needs for our employees, for the people who make the work happen? That's so important. It really is. It's not easy. The work that all of us are doing, it's not easy anymore. And, you know, we've got that combined with the whole wage war. And, you know, some organizations just can't afford to keep up with that. So, how, you know, where where does it go? But again, I really thank all of you. This has been certainly enlightening, and I've got some good takeaways for my team to help us further this mission. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about a possible other takeaway. What goes beyond equity? This is for the whole group. What goes beyond equity? You remember, we talk about equity like this nebulous thing, and it's the it's the golden standard for what we all want to achieve. But what goes beyond equity? You unmuted, Mike. Go ahead and take a chance. <laughs> well, I, I think it's justice uh, after equity. Um, you know, what you see on the equity slide is uh, accommodations that allow everybody to participate in what's mm -hmm. in front of them. But beyond that, um, if you remove barriers, you don't need accommodations, right? So mm. um, <laughs> let's get rid of the wall. <laughs> let's get rid of the wall. Now, good, Mike must have seen our PowerPoint in advance. So <laughs> No, or, or I'm just answer. I'm really, really just in tune. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are. Now, what also goes beyond justice? You you mentioned this a little bit, Mike, already. But what goes beyond justice? Anyone? Evelyn wrote um, a fair chance to not only survive, but to thrive. Barrier reduction, yes. 
there's one word that encompasses what you just said. Give them a clue. It starts. Give them a clue. <laughs> it starts with an L. Uh, Krista said fairness. Love. <laughs> Aww, <Aww>. Yes. yes. <laughs> You know, we have to be careful with the word love in the workplace. But <laughs> love is a value. It is a value. Liberation. So we have justice, which Mike talked about tearing down the wall. And then liberation, which Evelyn said, being able to thrive and barrier reduction. No barriers at all. That's liberation. Mm -hmm. So what... Tracy's workplace is doing with Masonic, is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, they are completely removing these barriers. They are saying, you know what, what systems can we set up that make it just for everybody to be able to live and work and interact with our organization freely without judgment, without stress, and just be able to uh, be able to be. And I think so, it's important. I think it's important though, Stevon, for people to understand that it goes back to again the social determinants, right? And being able to mitigate so that a person can show up authentically to work and be able to do their job in a way that and if the workplace, I mean we spend a lot of time at work. Yeah. A lot of time. So if we're there, know that all that they bring, right? They bring their suitcases, luggage, all everything that they're facing at home is is compounded, right? And and they show up. And if I'm, you know, in a particular, if I'm not making enough money, if I have these barriers, you know, in terms of cell phone, or if I got to return back to, you know, a particular. Um, uh, area that that may not necessarily be uh physically safe right we we've just gotta and I, I know bryson brought this up earlier we have to be conscious of the mental health impact and stressors mm -hmm. that employees bring um when they're showing up to work mm -hmm. any other comments on justice and liberation and how that shows up uh within your workplace accomplishments that you all have that you all have um, policies, practices that you've implemented uh, to make it easier for people to work. Okay, we only got 10 minutes, so. Okay, well, we'll move on. Move on. <laughs> um, and you know, I think what I wanna do is, um, we're gonna skip this slide. Let's go okay. to, I wanna do the identity wheel. I think that, this, that would be a good place to kind of stimulate conversation and then kind of wrap up from there with the four with the five five objective questions. Um, so quickly, um, will you go to the identity wheel, please? Thank you. So what I want you to do is this is this is an activity that I want you to draw a tree on a piece of paper and from that tree, I want you to uh, uh, build out some branches and you know there may be about mm, mm, I'm gonna say about 10 different areas but what we're gonna do is we are going to um, we are going to really lean in on building our identity wheel and then we're gonna have conversation around how do you show up in the workplace and then that therefore it allows you to um, really begin to hone in on the intersectionality in terms of your employees. So I want you to draw a tree, make sure your tree has a tree trunk and has um, branches that stem from that tree. And I'm going to call out some attributes and I want you to list those attributes on your tree branch. I'll give you a moment to do that. I'm going to be moving quickly. So you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. 
the first um, attribute you, I want you to identify is the age. Write down your age. Write down your age on a tree branch. The second thing I want you to identify is indicate your gender slash sexuality. Indicate your, and we will not be sharing these out loud at all. I just want you to be able to look at your identity tree. The third area or the third indicator is race. Race. The fourth is nationality. What is your nationality? The next one is language. What language or languages do you speak? The fifth area is ethnicity. What is your ethnicity? The next one is what is the status of your health? Is it good, fair, not so good, average? The next attribute I want you to indicate is your marital status. What is your marital status? What is your social economic status? Social economic status. And if I'm going too fast, Stevon has them listed also in the chat. What is your professional background? What is your professional background? What are some things you are interested in? What skills do you have? What skills do you have? What is an area of passion for you? What is an area of passion for you? Um, list three values. What are three of your core values? Do you want those on a branch, Letty, or in the trunk of the tree? Um, put them on the trunk of the tree. Thank you. That's a great question. Trunk of the tree. If you put it on a branch, it's fine, but trunk of the tree. Our values are the core of who we are. And then also on the trunk of your tree, indicate how you would describe your personality. Or if you've taken a personality assessment, go ahead and list um, if you are um, a if you're um, inf if you're disc, if you know what your disc personality is, or how would people describe your personality? So I'll review those quickly. Number one, age, gender, and sexu sexuality, race, nationality, language, ethnicity, health status, marital status, social economic status, professional background, interests, skills, passions. Three values on the trunk of the tree and describe your personality. So take a moment, take a look at your tree 
by no means do we think that we have covered all of the uh, dimensions of diversity with this will or with the things that the attributes that we called out today. But what we do know is, is that that we are influenced. And so we wanted to take the opportunity to help you to cultivate your self-awareness and your lens of how you influence decision making. Um, what bubbles up for you in terms of when you're looking at recruitment and retention and ideas and cultivating and fostering those ideas in terms of racial equity um, in the in the workplace. So if someone would, um, I'm going to take, I know we're running close on time. We only have a, a few minutes left. Someone, you know, unmute, talk about what did you notice about your particular tree? What did you notice about your particular tree? I noticed that all the things that, so the core, the my morals and then how I describe myself as well as the things that I'm passionate about. So the things that I really feel like make me up are closer to the core in my trunk mm -hmm. where a lot of the demographic information and things that how I kind of see myself are up towards the top because I don't hold those things as closely to myself. So those are not the things that, so it's what I allow other people to know where these other things are things that I try to keep more to myself and keep those things closely protected. So that way, because it's how I define myself, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else? I noticed, and this is from Ann, I noticed that the aspects on the tree are probably apparent, not hidden from other, whereas I do have aspects of my identity that are not shared. Example, military background. Very good, very good, Ann. Anyone else? Let me get one more person. Did anyone have trouble completing any of the branches? What did you think about this exercise? Are you guys still thinking? <laughs> I think I found it interesting, you know, how many things are just the fluke or accident of birth? You know, this is this is what happened because this is what I was born into versus, you know, the values and you get into the things where you start to discern and make decisions and decide for yourself who you're going to be versus the things you were born into or born a attached to, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And sometimes mm -hmm. you're kind of clawing away from some of those things too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, going back to looking at the social determinants, right? That is so important for us to understand how we show up, right? It, it's the whole philosophy, and we didn't get to get into this, but it's the whole philosophy of me than we, right? How am I impacted, right? <laughs> um, how am I impacted, and what does that, um, how do I, how does that influence the decisions that I make, and how do, you know, and the, the things that I advocate for? We have one minute left. Stephon, will you go to the very, go to the transformational change by design slide. So um, we, we didn't get to get into this, um, but I want to leave you and you will get a copy of this particular slide. Unfortunately, the slide with the diversity dimensions, we won't be able to share that slide. I'm sorry, Bryson, I seen his note. <laughs> um, but you can certainly hire us. We will come and perform it for you. <laughs> um, but I wanted to leave you guys with this last slide and you will get a copy of this one. Um, so when we're looking at transformation inside of an organization, there are four or five questions that we really want to challenge you all as employers to really think about. And the number, the, the first question is the clarity question. What is the measurable win for workplace equity in your particular business? 
The second question is, what is the reality? How are you doing in the area of workforce equity? The third question is around systems. What are you doing to achieve workplace equity? The fourth one is culture. What is the keys to success for workplace equity? And then the last and fifth question is, what is around improvement? What is one thing if we got better as an organization that we could do in order to improve um, the employee's experience, help them to show up in terms of their identity, and also help them to see their intersectionality in terms of the business that we are, um, we are in. So I want to just conclude because I want to be respectful of people's time. What is one thing that you feel like you can do now? What is something that you took away as a result of the conversation that we've had today? And said question, assumptions regarding systems and processes. Okay. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yes. I'm just going to say um, maybe one of the takeaways is that most of the things that people are discriminated for are basically characteristics that they can't. Uh oh, Krista, you're breaking up pretty bad. Can you hear us? Yeah, I have some weird audio issues. Can you hear me? Yeah. Kind of going in and out a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Okay. <laughs> okay. The things that people are discriminated for are things that they can't choose in the first place. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Anyone else? I want to open the floor for any questions you might have or Ann said, love this webinar. Thank you so much. It's transformational and insightful. Very good. Thank you so much. Great to see you, Ann. <laughs> well, that concludes um, the workshop for today. Um, I'll turn it back over to you, Mike. Well, we're definitely past time, and I do want to let everybody get to their next meeting or, or lunch or what have you. I just uh, appreciate everybody's participation today and openness to learning. I really uh, want to thank Gifted by Design for so artfully leading the conversation. I, I truly appreciate that. Um, Kentuckiana Works, through through some of the grant work we're doing, we'll, we'll be having other webinars coming up in the coming months. Um, we will focus uh, on uh, youth voice and worker voice uh, two months out. Uh, next month, we're going to have a webinar that looks at positive youth development, kind of focusing on that transitional age worker um, and, and kind of the brain development issues that that worker may have that, that it's important to, to, to know about as an employer. So uh, I'll definitely get that information out to you all as it shapes up. But thanks. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>